Good evening and welcome to today's BIC streams in collaboration with the Bengaluru Sustainability Forum. Uh, today's session is Missing the Forest for the Trees, Pandemics, Biodiversity and the Circle of Life. This is uh, part three of our climate series uh, curated by uh, Jenny Pinto from the Bangalore International Center. Before I hand it over to Mansi from the Bengaluru Sustainability Forum, I would like to welcome all our panelists, uh, Satyajit Mayor, Harini Nagendra, Mahesh Shankaran, and Uma Ramakrishnan. Welcome everyone. Uh, with that, uh, over to you, Mansi. So yeah. for those in the audience uh, who don't know us yet, uh, the Bengaluru Sustainability Forum is an inter-institute initiative. Our main objective is to facilitate discussions and dialogues around the issues of sustainability in urban areas with a focus on Bangalore. And we do this by encouraging and enabling interactions, exchange of knowledge and collaborations across disciplines on different aspects of urban sustainability. We are hoping to reach out to a wider audience with this collaborative series with BIC. Uh, so today, as we try to understand the interconnections between climate change, biodiversity loss, and pandemics, uh, the session will be moderated by Professor Satyajit Mayer, who is the director of the National Institute of Biological Sciences, Bangalore. I invite him to please start the session. Thanks, um, Mansi. Um, and also thanks, uh, BIC, Jenny, and Ravi. Uh, for <clears throat> hosting this, uh, this session, uh, Missing the Forests for the Trees. Um, I, you know, I, I am uh, at the National Center for Biological Sciences, uh, where we study all scales of biology. Um, I'm a self biologist, but you know, in, the in the center, we study biology from the scale of a molecule all the way to the scale of ecosystems. So I've actually taken uh, you know, the opportunity to uh, bring on, uh, in addition to two of our advertised guests, Uma and Harini, uh, I've asked um, Mahesh Shankaran, a colleague of mine at the NCBS, to join us this evening for this discussion, this discussion uh, also as a discussion. Uh, but before we begin, let me uh, say something about why I think this discussion uh, is an important one for us to be having at this time. Um, and, you know, we're having it also motivated a bit by the COVID-19 pandemic uh, that has highlighted humanity's vulnerability to, to uh, our own understanding of the natural world. And the discussion around missing the forest for trees this evening uh, is likely to feature our increasing uh, engagement with our, or increasing engagement, involvement, or even destructions of our wild spaces, and how we are possibly creating more crises for ourselves by failing to address both biodiversity loss and climate change. Um, at the BSF itself, we felt it would be wise to bring some of these aspects back to the center of the discussion, because it has long been known that drivers of zoonotic diseases like the current pandemic are due to diminishing forests and the loss of biodiversity. Uh, climate change itself is likely to bring more health hazards, disrupt our food systems, and increase the decline of such ecosystem services such as water and uh, breathable air. And it will further test our resolve to protect the nature that feeds us, provides health care, mitigates climate-induced disasters, and sustains the poorest and the most vulnerable segments of our society. Harini is likely to address this specifically in the context of our own geography uh, in Bangalore. I'm looking forward to hearing from her. Um, as we recover uh, from this unprecedented pandemic and begin to rebuild our economy, uh, we must foster a new and more equitable self-reliant society. I mean, that goes without saying. But how we do this is going to be an important uh, indication of whether we've learned anything from this pandemic. And I think this is where uh, our understanding of the natural world and how we bring it into our plans for the future are going to be crucial. Uh, we think that this is a great opportunity for course correction in our development pathways to make them more nature-friendly and sustainable. And the pandemic 
has painfully reinforced the message that nature-based and nature-friendly development pathways that sustain ecosystem services and its dependent livelihoods have to be one of the pillars of our economic and development policies. Um, I'm sure Mahesh may address some of these issues, uh, but we shall see. I am personally alarmed, in fact, by the large-scale uh, large scale spate of projects uh, that have been recently approved, which will degrade natural habitats and further endanger our long-term security. I believe that we have an opportunity to rebuild our green infrastructure to enhance biodiversity, strengthen ecosystem services, and generate natural solutions which might mitigate environmental disasters, including such pandemics. In fact, I shudder to think of what could be the consequence of a second pandemic if we do not change our thinking. And I, it'd be worth hearing from Uma what she has to say about uh, these uh, matters. Anyway, this is a good moment for me to briefly introduce uh, uh, my invited discussant, um, Mahesh Shankaran, uh, and our panelists this evening. Um, Mahesh um, is an ecologist uh, who um, is, besides being an outstanding scientist and a great mentor in his day job at NCBS, has also been part of global climate change initiatives. He is, in fact, the coordinating lead, lead author on the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Uh, and has produced the Land Degradation and Restoration Assessment and the review editor for Intergovernmental pa Panel on Climate Change, uh, a special report on land. So look forward to hearing from him in a little while. Uma, uh, bes besides the uh, biography that you will see in the chat box, she is well known and recognized for her work on the biogeography of tiger populations and is devised many modern methods to track and study tiger populations and their sensitivity to the, the local, uh, local geography that they, that they live in. She also investigates uh, ecological and evolutionary context of emerging infectious disease and um, also engages with policymakers and I'm sure she'll have something to say about the current pandemic. Um, Harini Nagendra needs no introduction and uh, besides the bio on her chat on the chat box that you will all be able to see. Um, I, just, I would like to add a couple of words uh, because she's an extraordinarily uh, imaginative writer and also somebody who's been engaging in, in a very sustained manner with the local ecosystem that we live in, that is Bangalore. And her work, I think in the current pandemic is going to be very important in bringing about a change in how we imagine the future through the lens of sustainability. And, that, and so, um, uh, before I invite Mahesh to say um, a few words preceding our main panelists for the evening, uh, let's, let me explain the format of this, uh, of this conversation. Um, Mahesh will uh, lead off, and then we'll have Uma, uh, followed by Harini. Uh, at the end uh, of the, these, uh, these uh, small uh, segments, um, we will have a, a discussion amongst ourselves and raise a few questions for them if you have any, and then open up the questions which I hope you will post uh, during the presentation, but we shall take uh, at the end. So without further ado, uh, let me invite Mahesh uh, to begin um, and uh, 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 to begin our discussion on missing the forest for the trees. Mahesh. Thanks, Jitu, uh, and a very good Evening to all of you who've tuned in to this session on pandemics, biodiversity, and the circle of life. So before we hand it over to the panelists, uh, you know, and let them sink their teeth into the meat of the discussion, so to speak, we thought it might be a good idea to spend, uh, you know, a few minutes right at the start, just talking broadly about why biodiversity is important for human well-being, why we should bother conserving it, and what we stand to lose when we fail to do so. Um, yeah, the, there are many reasons to conserve biodiversity. Uh, one obvious one is obviously for its intrinsic value. We know the biodiversity around us represents, uh, you know, uh, the historical legacy of over a million years of evolution. And that in itself is a strong enough reason to conserve biodiversity. But scientists have also known for some time now that biodiversity is critical 
for having well-functioning ecosystems. And in fact, this uh, thinking can be traced back over 150 years. Uh, Charles Darwin um, wrote in The Origin of Species that was published in uh, 1859, and I quote, it has been experimentally proved that if a plot of ground be sown with one species of grass and a similar plot be sown with several distinct genera of grasses, a greater number of plants and a greater weight of dry herbage can thus be raised. So it turns out that uh, this was not an experiment that Darwin conducted himself, but he was talking about an experiment conducted in the 1850s by uh, a gentleman known as George Sinclair. The experiment was con uh, conducted at the Woburn Abbey in Southwest England. And George Sinclair, it turns out, was the head gardener of the Duke of Bedford. Now, I, I think George Sinclair must have been a very perceptive person or he had a lots of free time on his hands. But anyhow, either way you look at it, this is probably one of the first experiments on record where people actually manipulated biodiversity and then saw what are the consequences of that for the way ecosystems function. And since then, and particularly in the last 20 to 30 years, scientists have carried out these experiments all over the globe. Essentially what they do is they try to create these communities with different numbers of species, so two species, four species, eight, 16, and so on. Or you experimentally remove species from communities, and then you look and see what happens uh, to the way the, com the community and ecosystems function. And uh, you know these experiments have been carried out in grasslands. People have carried them out in beakers with different microbes. They've carried them out in tanks with fish, with ponds, lakes, so on and so forth, and even forests. And a common theme that actually emerges from all of these experiments is that biodiversity enhances ecosystem functioning. What do I mean by that? So if you go back to the experiment that Darwin was talking about, essentially what they did was you know, they grew different numbers of plants on a plot of land, and they looked at the rate at which these plants converted sunlight into plant matter. And all of us know that all life on Earth is fueled by energy from the sun. We know plants actually convert that energy through the process of photosynthesis to sugars, which then drives life at all other trophic levels. So you, even as humans, we're able to work because of the energy we derive from the food that we eat, which ultimately comes down, uh, can be traced back to plants, right? So, so why is it that uh, when you have more species, you have greater function? So in this case, if you go back to the experiment that Darwin was talking about, the actual answer is because different species do different things in different ways. So if you have a plot of, plot of land with a whole different set of species, some of them may be deep rooted, some of them may be shallow rooted, some of them may be better, better at getting nitrogen, others at phosphorus and so on. So when you have all these different sets of species, they actually use the resources better and they're able to convert in this case, a function called, you know, which is transferring uh, sunlight into usable energy for life on earth. And the same thing holds true with many other functions. If uh, people have looked at, they've looked at the ability of ecosystems to clear up water, to recycle nutrients and so on and so forth. But the bottom line here is when you have more species, because species do things differently, it tends to enhance various aspects of ecosystem functioning, right? And from these functions actually come services. Uh, many of you might have heard the term ecosystem services before. And essentially, for those of you who haven't, uh, they refer to the benefits that human derive, uh, humans derive from ecosystems. So these could be things like uh, food, fiber, fuel wood, timber, non-timber forest produce, medicinal plants, so on and so forth. Many things that are easily quantifiable. But there's also a whole range of other services that ecosystems provide, uh, which are less easily quantifiable, like clean air, clean water, storm regulation, climate regulation, disease regulation, and also cultural services, right? Spirituality, a sense of place, and so on. And many of these are hard to quantify, but uh, scientists have made attempts to actually put monetary values to uh, the services that humans derive from ecosystems. And this runs into the trillions of dollars. And in fact, one assessment actually uh, says that the amount of uh, ecosystem services that humans derive is equal to the annual global GDP. And these are services that are provided free by ecosystems and biodiversity underpins it all, right? 
right? Uh, before, I just want to make two other points about the role of biodiversity uh, in ecosystem functioning. Um, so there are also lots of experiments to show that biodiversity also enhances resilience to external perturbations. You know, these could be droughts or high uh, extreme rainfall events. And this is particularly pertinent to the current time, given that we're in the middle of the climate crisis and droughts are predicted to go up. Uh, extreme rainfall events are going to go up. And there's a lot of evidence to show that more diverse ecosystems actually are affected less and recover faster than less diverse ecosystems. So for example, people have looked at agroforestry systems uh, in Latin America, and they've shown that species rich systems recover quicker following a hurricane than species poor ecosystems. Right? And again, the reason for this is fairly simple. It's not rocket science. It's a purely probabilistic argument. The more species you have, the greater the likelihood that you're going to have some species that are able to deal with that perturbation. So if you take drought, if you have more species, there's a greater chance that some of them are drought tolerant and they can actually compensate for other species that are not. So another point, take home message here is that when you have greater biodiversity, you have greater resilience to these perturbations. And a classic example for this uh, uh, that people talk about is the Irish potato famine of 1845. Uh, so this was, there was a blight that actually wiped out a lot of the you know, potato crop. And uh, people estimate that it resulted in over a million deaths and you know, triggered mass migrations in Ireland. And scientists believe that you know, the, the, the catastrophe was as major as, as it was because the Irish relied on one single strain of potato, which is called the Irish lumper. So in this case, it's not species diversity, but it was genetic diversity. And the take home message here being the more genetic diversity or species diversity you have, the greater the resilience of ecosystems to external perturbations such as climate change, disease outbreaks, and so on and so forth. Right? So basically, there are many reasons for us to conserve biodiversity. There is intrinsic value, there's, it provides, it enhances ecosystem function, it enhances ecosystem services, and it imparts stability to communities. But unfortunately, uh, we have not been very good at conserving uh, biodiversity. If you look at a lot of the global assessments that have recently come out, which is the IPBES uh, land degradation assessment and the IPCC uh, special report on land, essentially what they, uh, the picture they paint is pretty alarming. Humans now directly impact 70% of the Earth's land surface, ice-free land surface. Uh, and you know, such effects are particularly pronounced in countries like India. 25% of this land is degraded, uh, which means, and it's estimated about 3.2 billion people are affected by this land degradation, and it's costing about 10% of the annual GDP in terms of lost uh, services, right? And so there's a clear need for conserving biodiversity, and when we don't pay enough attention to it, we can see that the consequences uh, can be fairly disastrous. So when we clear cut land, we actually or lose biodiversity. We not only lose ecosystem services, but we also, in some cases, increase ecosystem disservices. Now, this is not a term I like to use, but it's been used in the literature. So things like human wildlife conflict tends to go up uh, because of greater contact between humans and wildlife. And this has huge economic costs, and also it comes at the cost of human life. Uh, when we clear cut forests, we increase the incidence of local disease. Uh, you know, there's evidence to show that, you know, when sections of the Amazon are being clear cut, the uh, malaria, incidence of malaria goes up. And of course, there's, you know, we're in the midst of it. When you change land, it can also lead to global level pandemics, such as the kind we are witnessing today. So all in all, you know, there is a role for biodiversity to play in conserving ecosystem, in conserving ecosystem services and providing resilience uh, to these services. But when we change nature, uh, you know, either excessively or in the wrong way, then the consequences can be disastrous as we are seeing right now. So why are we in the middle of this pandemic and what can we do and what are the lessons that we can learn actually going forward? And those are the top, uh, those are the points that, uh, you know, Uma Ramakrishnan and Harini are going to talk about. And so with that, uh, hopefully brief introduction, I will hand it over to Uma. Right. Thank you, Mahesh. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. And thanks for this invitation. It's really nice to be here with all of you. 
as as Jitu mentioned, I'm Uma. I've been at NCBS the last 15 years or so, and I work on biodiversity. I'm going to walk you through some slides uh, more because I really love maps, and I hope you do too. So let's see if this works. OK, can, you can all see the slides, right? Great. So this is a beautiful map. It shows, actually, the distribution of biodiversity across the world. Mahesh was telling us a lot about why biodiversity is important. Uh, and I'm someone who just loves patterns. And so this actually shows us the numbers of vertebrates, which is basically all those animals which have backbones, you know, fish, uh, fish uh, herbs, um, amphibians, uh, mammals, birds, and so on, reptiles. And you can see, first of all, that biodiversity is not equitably distributed across the world, right? Some places have a lot more biodiversity. Some places are red hot, like uh, parts of the Amazon or parts of Africa, also parts of Southeast Asia, a little bit in India. But some places definitely have much more biodiversity than do others. So this is, is really important because when we talk about uh, things like services, uh, and Mahesh mentioned that, you know, uh, when there are places which have more species, they're more resilient and they provide more services, uh, it also happens that this biodiversity is not equitably distributed. And so uh, loss of biodiversity in one place, uh, losing a hectare of forest in the Amazon has much greater consequences, for example, than losing the same area in the US because the number of species in the US are much, much fewer. So I just want you to uh, focus also a little bit on, on India. I'm sure you can see that uh, there seems to be like a, a trail of biodiversity from Southeast Asia, and that's basically the Himalayas. Uh, and you can see, for example, the Northeast is, is much more lit up than many other parts. These are uh, things you've probably heard and read about in the newspaper, how India is a mega biodiversity hotspot and how the Northeast is a biodiversity hotspot. But these are some things, these are patterns you can see just by simply adding up all the number of species which occur in a specific location. You'll also notice that biodiversity correlates with mountain ranges. So you can, for example, see the outline of the Western Ghats uh, in the southern part of India, uh, <clears throat> a long linear mountain chain, which also has uh, quite high biodiversity. And many of you have probably visited the Western Ghats as well. Um, so now let's look at the world in a different lens. This is basically biodiversity across the world. And we're just talking about vertebrates. Humans are not represented here, for example, their population densities. But this map uh, paints a much grimmer picture. So this is basically uh, land use change or how lands have changed in the last uh, 20 or so years. Uh, and this is uh, based on a study published a couple of years, a few years ago, already four years ago. So uh, the change is probably even greater as uh, Mahesh talked about in the reports that he has worked on. Uh, and you can see, for example, that India is mostly very red. And actually, uh, you know, you can see that same trail of the Himalayas, which is bright red, uh, as are the Western Ghats, as is uh, a large proportion of the Eastern Ghats, actually, uh, in the eastern part of India. So, uh, and this seems quite disproportionately high. So, of course, there are parts of Africa which are strongly affected as well, and, uh, and, and South America. But notice how the Amazon, which was bright red for species, uh, doesn't seem to have seen so much land use change. So that's a very interesting uh, thing because um, we still have, though this may change, uh, some places in the world where there are large swatches of you know, contiguous uh, biodiversity. But that's definitely not true for India. Uh, most of our systems are impacted by humans, as you can see, for example, in this map. Now, I, I work on biodiversity and understanding it from an evolutionary perspective. So, for example, in the Western Ghats, we try to understand uh, why certain parts of the Western Ghats have more species than others. And, for example, there, uh, our studies showed that it had to do with the shape of the mountain range. So, when the mountains dip uh, and rise up again, uh, when there are these deep valleys, we find that species on either side speciate or differentiate. And this results in more species on either side of this mountain gap, for example. 
So reasons for having more species uh, would be uh, an evolutionary question. Why are there more species in one place than the other? Of course, uh, there are ecological reasons. Um, for example, there's, uh, you know, in the tropics, we always have more species and so on. So now uh, today's discussion is not just about biodiversity, which is fascinating on its own. Uh, apart from uh, thinking about, you know, why it's important for our well-being, uh, just seeing species having uh, uh, biodiversity around us is, is something which is really special, right? Um, but today uh, we seem to be thinking about biodiversity again with this with the lens of this pandemic, because we know it's a, it's evolved or emerged. Uh, from biodiversity, right? We know that this pandemic, which is of course now spreading between humans, has come from biodiversity to us. So uh, this is called an emerging infectious disease, now also called re-emerging because diseases emerge multiple times. For example, Nipah, Nipah virus has emerged or crossed over from bats to people several times in several places, right? So Nipah might be an example of a re-emerging disease, but for example, SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus which causes COVID-19, has emerged uh, from uh, somewhere, but uh, there are viruses in bats which are similar to this. If we look at the genome sequence of SARS-CoV-2. So why does this happen? Or can we actually predict where and when disease emergence will happen? This is a very difficult question, I think, uh, a lot of people have thought a lot about it and why we can't. Um, so the thing is, when do we study this after the disease has emerged, right? And so then you only know about a situation where there has been an emergence. So there are people who have done meta analyses, which means they collect all of these data on when a disease emerged and they look at what are correlates or things associated with disease emergence. So this is my final map and uh, basically should be prepared. It's kind of scary. <laughs> but uh, here again, we see the world and uh, you know, the brighter parts of the world are areas where these models predict higher probability of disease emergence. And again, you can see that India is very bright as is China as well, right? So now this is a model, right? This is a prediction. So of course we have to take it with a grain of salt, but if you actually break down the model and ask, why is it that India or China show this high probabilities of disease emergence? Well, there's three factors which actually correlate very strongly with the probability of disease emergence. First is high mammal biodiversity. So most of the zoonoses we get, most of these infections um, come from uh, closely related species, right? So it's unlikely that we'll get an infection from a fish. Um, it's much more likely that we would uh, get an infection from a monkey because they are closer to us uh, evolutionarily. We split uh, in evolutionary time from monkeys more recently. And so our biology is more similar to them, right? So just because of evolutionary processes, uh, mammals are more likely to transmit diseases to us. Uh, or those diseases are more likely to be successful in us. So you can see that, so uh, sorry, I got carried away, but basically I was saying that there's three correlates which are the strongest here. Uh, the first is high mammal diversity. So then you will say, aha, you know, maybe biodiversity is not so good after all. I'll come back to that in a minute. But the other two very strong correlates are high land use change. And that is why, for example, the Amazon isn't bright red here. The Amazon has, you know, five times or more as many species uh, of mammals than we have in India. But on the other hand, India is much brighter color, much higher probability of disease emergence because as I showed you just in the other map, land use change in India or human impact on land use change has been very high. And the final uh, correlate is human population density, again, really high in India and China, right? So these, these three factors basically correlate very strongly with disease emergence. And then that, so that tells us, um, I don't know what uh, it says to you, but to me, it feels that, okay, you know, now we're busy dealing with uh, COVID-19, we're dealing with this pandemic. Um, but, you know, we got lucky that we've not, we've had some outbreaks in India, but not that many, right? 
Um, maybe there have been many which are undetected. Uh, but from what we know, there have been outbreaks, but not something like this. Nothing which has evolved in India and then gone across the world, right? Uh, so, but on the other hand, I think we have a high risk of that. So we should be cautious when thinking about the future, because this is something which will happen again. It, it's bound to, right? Uh, so how are we going to move ahead knowing that A, we have high biodiversity, and B, we have high population density, and C, the risk of disease emergence is high in a place like India where there's a lot of fragmented habitats and a lot of land use change. Are we going to continue um, parceling biodiversity into smaller and smaller bits and patches, which will increase this kind of threat? Uh, or are we going to take a different approach? So um, I guess I'll stop there uh, and maybe I will oops, sorry, I this share screen. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let uh, Harini uh, hand over to Harini. Thanks, Uma. That, so, and uh, thanks everyone for this invitation and all of you who are uh, here listening. Uh, so it's I think this has been a very interesting chart of why we need biodiversity, how biodiversity changes are creating uh, uh, various impacts on people, right? So we, um, I think the two very interesting things have happened in the time of this pandemic and quite different things in a way. At one level, those of us in cities, of course, I should clarify those of us who are lucky enough to have a roof over our heads, who are not worried about meals, where our next meal is coming from, most of us listening to this podcast. Uh, so those of us who have this relative good fortune to survive lockdown are still facing mental stress of various kinds. I mean, obviously, it's uncertain times. You see all kinds of things in the news. Uh, life has changed. You don't know uh, what, what the future of the world is going to look like. So we're all stressed in various ways, some more so, some less so. And I think overwhelmingly, whether it's around the world or in cities across India, you find people saying that access to nature is one of the things that is really helping them survive the stress. So for one, I think it's been very interesting that in cities across uh, the world, you find that uh, noise, bird sound, insect noise, noise of crickets, noise of a frog is louder and louder these days because you... Uh, you don't have anything else going on. Traffic noise is low, right? The second thing that you, so you pay more attention to these bird noises and frog noises. You also see things, I think, I mean, um, definitely near my house, you, we see a lot of birds coming down into our garden to sit on the grass, which they weren't doing before. Swoop down on flights, a kite comes down, almost brushes your head and goes off. You know, these kinds of things. So there's, uh, there's clearly a lot going on in terms of changing bird behavior and uh, insect noises and things that you can hear. Part of it is just the less uh, human traffic and uh, other kinds of traffic, motorized traffic. So birds can move around a lot more. Secondly, you can just hear things much easier than you could before. So that's one part of it. The second part of it is the fact that uh, you have, uh, on the other hand, as we're realizing that nature is extremely important to us, what are we doing about nature? Most of our conversations about nature seem to be going in the completely opposite direction. What is, let's, let's take some examples. So you can look at uh, the National Board for Wildlife and uh, the Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change. What they've been doing is meeting virtually online. And these are relatively short meetings where they are giving environmental clearances to a large number of projects. And the number of projects we don't still have a handle on but it seems like there's something like 10 minutes that is being given for every discussion of a single project and cleared. So there are at least 30 large projects that have been cleared across the country. Okay. This is a time, remember, that we, we are in the middle of a pandemic. We know that uh, scientists across the world and expert groups of, across the world have been warning of the likelihood of a new pandemic coming from at least 2003, okay, from the time of the previous SARS epidemic. And uh, these warning calls have been many and multiple, but they're all saying that stop clearing forests. Stop, essentially, when you increase the, the contact between humans and wild species in areas where this contact was not as widespread anymore, 
you're going to get more chances of species jumping from animals to humans. And that's just common sense. I mean, we, I think the science has been really well presented, but there's also an element of very basic common sense here that you want to minimize those opportunities to some extent. Right? If you're not in minimizing those, how are we going to minimize these opportunities? At the time of COVID, we are left with this sort of odd uh, choice with, between us. We know that the economy is down. The lockdown has impacted it, the loss of jobs, the fact, and this is not peculiar to India. Globally, there's a lockdown and globally there's um, of various kinds and globally there are job losses of various kinds. So we know for the, for the next two years or so, the world is going to enter an economic recession of the kind that we haven't seen before. Now, there are two ways to handle this. One way is the way that, for instance, many cities across the world seem to be trying to handle it, saying that we need to do development in a different way. So Milan, Paris, but not just Milan and Paris, there's also Bogota, there's also, you know, uh, different countries, uh, cities in different countries, uh, for instance, many African cities, which are trying to rethink their model of development. Can we make cities more cycle friendly, more, more walk pedestrian friendly, reduce the amount of smog and pollution, increase the number of trees, create a buffer between the city and the forest outside. Can we rethink development in a way, move to renewable energy and make our uh, economic growth come on the basis of solar and wind energy? Things like that. There's also a way that India, unfortunately, seems to be possibly following, uh, saying that, look, we need economic growth. And so never mind the ecology. That is something that can be sacrificed. So for the next two years, let's just focus on increasing, you know, providing mining permissions, providing industrial permissions, opening roads, railways, etc. Just getting there and aggressively increasing economic growth. Is that the model that we want to follow, especially when we know what the risks are? I mean, I think we're really working in a very short-term fix. And there are a number of reasons why we shouldn't be thinking of this approach to economic growth. Let's think through a number of them. The first is the pandemic. I mean, the risks of future pandemics. But the second is the economic issue of livelihoods themselves. So for instance, after the forest rights, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, uh, but uh, looking at uh, forest rights issues in India, a few years ago, a lot of community groups and tribal groups across the country were giving, given, uh, at least technically, rights to certain patches of forest that they could maintain as community forests. So this was the Forest Rights Act. And it's been very controversial, and there are steps to take those rights back and keep these as government forests. However, it's, I think, very clear, if you look at anecdotal reports across India, that wherever communities have got forest rights, they get more income out of their forest from selling bamboo, from selling tendu patta, from selling all kinds of minor forest products. These, you know, because they eliminate the middlemen, they get some income over that. What's important about the income? The important fact, fact about that income is that it makes distress migration less. So all this migration that you see on trains, getting back, you know, stranded, all the horrific stories, why are these people leaving their homes and coming to cities? Not because they want to or not because the city is an especially comforting place for them to live. It's an alienating place. It's, as we've seen, we've been, uh, I think urban India has been fairly horrific to these people. How can we strengthen their livelihoods? We can strengthen most of these livelihoods by strengthening nature. If you have grazing, that gives you a buffer for farmers. You know? Why when will you have grazing? If you have good grasslands, if you have good water supply, if you have good forest cover, that gives you a buffer so you can go in and collect a few products from the forest. This is not just in remote areas. Let's look at Bangalore. You know, we did a very interesting study on Bangalore very recently where we looked at people in Bangalore city harvest about four kilograms a year on average of small greens, wild greens that they don't grow in their house. They collect from open plots, empty lands, areas near lakes. This is the greens and the wild supplements. You know, people can't, often these are the low income people who can't afford to buy vegetables. This is what is keeping their nutritional diversity going. Four kilos to six kilos of family. This is mostly women. I mean, almost, in fact, 99% it's women. So it's women keeping this traditional knowledge going, women supplying their households with this. And you can see clearly that this contributes. I'm sure that post COVID, Incomes are going to go down and this kind of dependence on open land and foraging grow, goes up even more. What happens in a place like Bangalore then when you have the peripheral ring road project coming up, which is about 16 to 18,000 trees are going to go and the associated landscapes around those large areas are going to go. We did a survey and I think we've done this multiple times in Bangalore. And if uh, official estimates say it's 16,000 trees, unofficially we've done a few stretches and it's 
anywhere between three to five times the numbers of trees that they say are going to go that are actually going to go. You know, there are hornbills in some of these places, there are uh, grazers, there are fishers, there's healthy functioning ecosystems, but also healthy functioning people that use these ecosystems, not that prevents them from having to go to the market and buy milk or buy fish or buy these wild grains, right? So biodiversity is important for multiple things. I just sort of step back from that to say, can we now connect these two pieces? The people that live in the cities and have had a different imagination of nature. I think many of us in cities get very disconnected from nature, not necessarily because we want to, but our daily lives are just frantic and busy and we go to work and you come back late in the night and then you have stuff to do at home. But what this lockdown has forced many people to do is get back in touch with nature and understand how much it is important to lift your spirits, to understand that there are other things in the world, to give you a different imagination of reality, right? Can we take that imagination or that reconnect to the life around us and translate it to a different economic way of doing things? And I think we have paths to follow here. We can look at the different cities that have tried different uh, aspects of uh, re-engineering the economy, but importantly, we can also look at countries. As we speak, uh, the Democratic Party in the US is trying to do a, a Green New Deal, which is really a different way of approaching climate change as well as the economy, uh, economic growth. The European Union is trying to do the same. A lot of countries in Africa are trying to get together to find different paths. A number of Latin American countries similarly seem to be doing this. So it's not just the wealthy countries of the world and India doesn't have to come back to, our, I think, an old excuse that we've done many times that, oh, the rich countries can afford to do this. Question is, can we afford not to do this? And I think I'll take two examples. One is the cyclone that recently ravaged large parts of Kolkata and uh, West Bengal. The damage would have been far worse if you didn't have the East Kolkata wetlands and if you didn't have the Sundarbans. And I think that's something we really need to understand. You can try and put up engineering walls to coastlines, but a mangrove is going to be by far your best buffer. I think the tsunami of 2001 just showed us this, and it's very clear that a mangrove is by far your best buffer against climate change. Can we, in the world of climate change, which is coming and hitting us, can we afford not to do this? However, what are we actually doing? Let's take Bombay, for instance. I mean, the Bombay, Navi Mumbai is now planning to do the second airport of Bombay on the Navi Mumbai wetlands, mangroves, which are not just biodiverse, they're extremely biodiverse, so there are all sorts of pandemic risks and health risks, but also very importantly, you're building uh, an airport now, which will probably be functional another five, six years from now, and five years from then, is going to get hit by floods. It makes no economic sense. It makes no ecological sense. It makes no sense in terms of health. So I think I'll just end with this, that we really need to think of a new model of growth. One that does not say uh, we can build now, we need the economy now and we can fix the ecology later, but to understand that the economy is not going to grow and health is not going to, our uh, health is really going to suffer unless we keep biodiversity first. So with that, I'll turn it over to back to Jitu and Mahesh. Um, thanks, um, Harini and uh, Uma. Uh, in, in, incredibly um, interesting, very broad, uh, uh, you know, picture that you painted of of the well, I guess of the uh, challenges ahead uh, when one begins to think about what you know what path to follow. Uh, I, I think there are a couple of things that I, I wanted to ask, and perhaps Mahesh may also uh, bring bring these um, issues up in a different way. Uh, um, my, my, my first question was um, to, to you, Harini. Uh, I mean, you know, when one talks about the, the alternatives, are there, are there alternatives that, that take into account the, the pressures that one sees from the kind of population that exists in, for example, in India and in China? So, you know, are there models of being able to think about green economies, given the 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 the, the pressures of, of such populations that, that we have? In fact, th that often seems to be the argument being made about not looking at the ecology today, but growing the economy so that people can then begin to afford to look at the ecology. I mean, I I I don't share that view, but I just want to bring that question up. Um, you know, uh, for you to think about or sure. for you to talk about. Yeah. 
Thanks. I think this is a really important question, and I think it it also depends on how we do our economic calculations. So, if you look at the, I mean, let's take the forest for instance, and if you just look at, uh, I think even a Wikipedia on Indian forests, you will see sort of interesting statistics that uh, contrast. One is the numbers of Indian people that are dependent on forests for some part of their daily lives. You know, it could be a little bit of grass, maybe some leaf litter, some. Uh, non-timber forest products, some milk, whatever else, fish, whatever else you get from the forest. So that, if you think of forest as the buffer that keeps them from being completely dependent on the modern economic system, that buffering capacity of the forest is huge. On the other hand, if you say how much does do India's forest contribute to India's GDP? It's a few. I think it's one percent or three percent or some trivial number. That's my contrast, really. Now, if you think of uh, nature as Contributing to India's GDP doesn't contribute much. So, if you're thinking of a GDP-focused economic growth, then obviously, I mean, which is what we think of, then for the kinds of densities of population, we need to just never mind the 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 ecology. You need to focus on the economy, which means carving up the forest into lots of tiny pieces, as Uma was saying. But if you're looking at the fact that this is the this nature is this buffer which is preventing people from going into that modern economy and they are not equipped to, as we've seen to i mean in this migrant crisis i think we clearly see that what are what are the states going to do with all these people that are coming back some states seem to be recognizing this huh? if you look at jharkhand for instance they have explicitly said that now that people are coming back they are going to do three things one is strengthen their sports system because of course you have a lot of good uh, sports people in uh, jharkhand but the other two are very interesting they are going to strengthen they're going to do a massive forest plantation program because they say if they have healthy forest people are not going to need to migrate as much and the second thing they're doing is trying to go back to their traditional water harvesting systems ponds tanks wells etc so they say if they fix those two then you have agriculture which is more nature friendly and you have the forest and if people have those they don't need to migrate so i think we need to really be thinking of these kinds of models bhutan seems to be doing this i think bhutan is an excellent model for us so there are models of different kinds but i think the really what we need is the courage of the imagination also and that seems to be lacking if we have one conventional view of this is our model of economic growth and it's gdp focused and it's growth year on year and we need the stock market and we need all of these i mean we've seen that that trickle down does not happen right it all is doing is i think there's a very interesting statistic i was reading recently about even in india about how the rich have grown richer and the poor have grown much poorer during this time of covid so the the stark disparities already that we see are just getting even more stark and so i mean clearly this model has failed uh, yeah no, um thanks harini i i think you know there's 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 a i mean there's a very compelling reasons for what you say uh and perhaps you know some of the uh the audience will will have more questions about that and we can take you know further issues on that point then um but for uma i had a uh, a question so uma um you know you you mentioned the idea of fragmentation and i mean how does one connect fragmentation of land and and forests to uh, to the emergence of epidemics and and also how does one convince you know you've been also on the national uh board for uh wildlife um and how does one convince people you know in these sorts of committees about the consequences of such such acts i mean you you might want to talk from some of your from some of your experience thanks thanks you do for that question so basically what happens when you have fragmentation is you have a lot of edges so imagine you had you know a large chunk of rainforest um you know the species that exist in a rainforest the community uh, is evolved over millions of years and relatively unique however if you instead had this rainforest you know dotted with plantations and so on and so forth the species uh, of say small mammals uh, you know rats and mice or bats uh, many uh, of whom are reservoirs for disease uh, which exist in say a plantation is quite different from that which exists in a rainforest or a grassland or a shola patch say in the western ghats so what happens then is when you have the more edges you have uh, the more small these patches are the more they will abut each other and the more edges you will have and these edges then become uh, zones for interaction and uh, from what we understand spillover happens 
uh, with the highest probability when new species contact each other. So they're called non-analogous communities. They're assembled newly, right? Uh, a tea plantation is a relatively new habitat. You know, 200 years is not old in evolutionary uh, time scales. And so the species which exist there have never seen the species which exist in the abutting, you know, uh, forest. And this is when, uh, when they do meet, uh, pathogens can quickly jump from one to the other. And this is what promotes spillover. So fragmentation does uh, impact spillover by creating additional edges and ecological opportunities for interaction between species which have not seen each other before. Now, as far as, uh, I'm, I, I guess I, I, I can't say that I have um, very, say anything very wise to say about uh, how to convince uh, you know, people in these committees and in the government and so on. But I guess, you know, what I have uh, felt is that environment is often seen as a cost, which is what we're experiencing in a way now. This pandemic is a huge economic cost. It is going to cost the government a lot. And uh, the economy, in a sense, needs to be propped up again. Uh, and so environmental degradation is always seen as a cost. And as Mahesh has been saying, Harini has been saying, these benefits are not explicitly incorporated. So they don't ever show up as any line item on any budget. But I think that one option really is to uh, counter, to provide alternatives, right? We cannot say that we cannot have development at all. But uh, the current uh, environmental impact assessment system, I think is pretty outdated. I think we can use you know, mod modern scientific approaches where we can possibly do scenario modeling or simulations to show effects of this versus that, the road here versus there, uh, this forest patch loss versus the other and build in a different cost to different stakeholders. Like for example, uh, the stakeholders Harini is talking about, uh, the people who live close to forests or the urban poor are never taken into consideration in any of these consultations. So A, they do need uh, a voice and B, I think maybe um, we, can, uh, we can actually talk about alternative models of development uh, and trade-offs that we have. Like for example, if you do put a, a road between say two uh, tiger reserves. Uh, it's not just that the tigers cannot move. If that increases the extinction probability of one particular tiger reserve, then the tourism industry of that tiger reserve collapses. So there are economic consequences of that as well. So somehow we need to be a bit more savvy and we need to also engage. We cannot just say, oh, this is bad and then just step back. We have to try and uh, you know, convince with data. I mean, I feel uh, what will happen if we do this versus that. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, I mean, very, I mean, basically bring science into some of these uh, decisions that are being made as well. Um, and of course, all the other considerations. So, so Mahesh, do you? Do you yeah, uh, so I just uh, yeah. wanted to take off just on this thread that uh, of the question that you raised and Harini's answer and Uma also touched upon this. So in large part, you know, people argue that, um, you know, we're seeing the extent of degradation globally, I'm not just talking about in India, because the environmental costs are not factored in into the decision-making process, right? So when you, uh, when you build a road or convert, uh, you know, mangroves to shrimp farms, uh, we don't factor in the loss of ecosystem services or public goods, basically private versus public goods. And I presume this is a problem, problem globally, but are there examples where people have actually done this successfully and that we can learn from? Uh, you know, in order to, you know, in the way ahead. Harini, Uma, anybody? Yeah. So, I mean, can you just clear, what kind of examples? I'm just. Uh, I mean, is it going to happen? I mean, none of us factor in, you know, environmental costs into any of our decision making process, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the economic costs are not factored in typically. Uh, so, Unless that comes about, uh, you know, do you think things will change? Can I, can I just jump in quickly and sure, maybe sure. Yeah, sure. I, I think that there's no moment like now, right? I mean, basically, there is, there is no way you can argue today that you could probably talk about pandemics and people would just raise their eyebrows. But now, and the link to biodiversity loss, but now you cannot argue that there is, there is global economic cost to this, right? And uh, I think it would be really important to calculate these costs. I'm sure there are some uh, estimates, uh, but to do this rigorously in India would be really uh, important. Uh, and especially uh, that the costs that are paid by 
uh, marginalized people, right? I think that if any government, I mean, if, if a government in India wants to stay in power, they must address these issues, right? I, I don't see a way out of that, but maybe there is. Um, that's my point of view. I don't know. I also, I, I mean, I think I completely agree that this is the time to seize. In fact, I was just looking at a survey in the UK and uh, which says that now if you look at people now, 20% more people in the UK than did before say that biodiversity is important. I mean, that, that climate change is very important to address post-coronavirus. You think these are completely unrelated, right? But uh, it's not. I mean, I think people are sitting there and realizing that there's a lot of connections between these things because you're otherwise on this treadmill. I mean, urban life to fail, let's face it, is a treadmill. And there's very little time for us to spend thinking about deeper issues of life. So I think people are realizing this. I'm pretty sure if you do this, even in India, I mean, there's so much discussion already in the media about connecting dots of a kind. Look at the locust swarms that we seem to be getting in India. I mean, that's a clear example people I mean, of why climate change in Antarctica is linked to what happens in Australia and East Africa, which then leads to locusts that come all the way to India. I think, I mean, the, the connections now are very real that you, you can't ignore. So I completely agree with Uma that this is the time we have to seize. If, if there's some time to make our argument for a change, it has to be now. Great. Yeah. So I, um, I, I, I think, I mean, there, it's, it's, Perhaps also time to get our audience um, right. <laughs> or, or questions from our audience um, to, to you guys. Uh, so perhaps I can I can you know uh, take some uh, bring some of them to your attention. They're in the chat screen. So Rajesh Ramakrishnan asks, how can impact on biodiversity be center staged in the environmental impact assessment in India. The draft EIA notification of 2020 is, of course, very inadequate. So, um, well, I guess, you know, I, I mean, what are the practical ways, I guess that's the question, that one can bring in by the, the arguments about biodiversity as well as, I would say, argue ecosystem costs. So, I mean, do any of you, I mean, including Mahesh, want to take any of this? Uh, take this take this question i think it's an important one i can uh, comment my you want to comment or i can uh, just mention the from a from oh, a please go ahead yeah from a perspective of uh, uh, well at least from a from a national perspective um, you know one of the approved uh, national missions there were several national yeah. missions approved last year uh, is called the national mission for biodiversity and human well-being uh, and uh, that a national mission which deals with environment has been approved is, is really great because the others are national mission on artificial intelligence, quantum computing, um, translation of uh, web content to various languages and so on. Deep sea exploration, just to give an example of a few. So I think that um, it then behooves uh, a lot of people uh, who work in the area of environment to you know, kind of seize such opportunities and work together. I think we are also to blame to some extent that maybe, you know, we need to also work together to bring this to center stage uh, at a national level, because um, if not, we would just appear divided. There may be different uh, opinions uh, in terms of, you know, extreme, you know, people friendly versus, uh, you know, wildlife friendly or whatever. But I think uh, opportunities like this national mission will at least they provide a way to bring this uh, because it's a government approved national mission potentially bring these issues into policy and to the and to the attention of government. The, that may be a small scale thing. Hmm. Arani, any, any thoughts on that? I also think the process needs to be fixed. I mean, if you look at uh, some of the EIs, you know, a couple of EIs in the news, the one in the Northeast and the one, the other one, which where the Less Institute of India's EI has been critiqued. Um, that needs to be uploaded online. Right. So you're saying there should be more transparency, right, Harini? Yes, yes. Yeah, that is. I think EIS should important. be uploaded for people to see. Yeah. There should be more transparency. Things should be subject to public opinion. 
uh, and I think also not just like whatever few people, but the public should demand that yes. these things be accessible because this is all this this land belongs to everybody, right? So everyone has a right to say something about about what's happening to it. Right. Yeah. So so I you know there's I mean connected to this is is sort of a a, a view, and this is coming from Krish Nair that forests should not be destroyed for, I mean, for development, he says. Uh, but as architects, they would like to see smaller cities or towns in non-forest areas close enough to the forest, which will in fact nurture wildlife and, and generate, um, you know, generate more, I guess, distributed living. Um, and so the question is, you know, if we can reduce the population of metros, uh, this should become a more equitable and, you know, and with a growth which is more sustainable. Now, I mean, how realizable is that sort of a, a formula for, for, you know, putting people into, into different landscapes I, I, is, I think, the question that's being asked. So do any of you have something to say? Um, I mean, what, what, could one, what could one, you know, think about a model like this? I think it's being asked from the perspective of, say, building new cities and you know this, this whole idea of creating new uh, new places for living outside major metropolises that is being followed right now. I think in any case, India is on a somewhat different path of urbanization. If you look at it, uh, India versus other, I mean, large countries urbanizing fast, we definitely will have many more small towns and small cities uh, than mega cities. So that seems to be anyway the pattern of growth. I mean, the largest, fastest growing cities are the small ones, not the large ones. So I think in some sense, this will happen. I think though, it seems like a lot of our um, national planning is focused on uh, supporting urban growth. So if we can simultaneously, while we're supporting urban growth, whether in the smaller cities and the larger cities, also support strengthening of rural economies. I think that also will help because... Uh, yes, I completely agree with uh, Mr. Nair that uh, you know that um, this kind of uh, you need to think non-metro. You can't have all of our focus on the Mumbai's and the Bangalore's and the Hyderabad's of uh, the country. But how do you do this? Because even this has its opportunities and its risks. So we need to. And the reality, I think, is however much we plan, I think China's shown us this that you can plan for new cities or different models of urban development, but people will go where people want to go. So a government or a, a big group that decides that, you know, you will have a, a urban planning of this kind or that kind, really people will finally decide and vote with their feet and decide to go where they want to go. So I think it's a question of, can you strengthen economies in more resilient ways? That's the core of the question. And that can that way be such that it uh, works with nature, not against nature. Right. Um, Mahesh, do you want to add something there? Uh, no, nothing more than what uh, Harini added in response to that question. No. Right. So, uh, yeah, do you, um, you know, so I, and, and another sort of interesting question has been posed uh, from Shruti Suresh saying that, uh, you know, perhaps uh, the climate, ex uh, climate extremes have reached a point of no return uh, and that the capacity of mm the ecological sort of systems that we, that we are surrounded by are unable to cope anymore. Um, so, you know, what, what does one do in such a, in such a context? I mean, I, are we, is, is, is everything hopeless? I think that's the question that's being asked. So, uh, I was just looking at the question and it looks like it's based on I mean, some of the examples drawn in the question is about the Nilgiris, where I think it was either last year, year before last, when there was, you know, it got 2,400 millimeters of rainfall in three days. I mean, it was just off the charts and there were huge landslides. People couldn't get back for like, uh, you know, a long time. Uh, so yes, we know climate uh, extremes are going up and maybe in some instances, if it is that extreme, even natural ecosystems may not be able to respond to it. But uh, more often than not, with many of these systems, they've also been 
transformed to some degree, which has reduced presumably the resilience of these systems. And in cases like this, I think restoration is a very key uh, tool that we need to be thinking of. And you also mentioned the National Biodiversity Mission that's been approved by, in principle. Uh, and restoration is a very major uh, focus of that. And I think restoration brings huge benefits. And that's something as a nation and as a society, we need to be investing more in and finding ways to restore ecosystems before it, it gets to the point that uh, you know, they're not restorable. So that's my- It goes back also to that. Mr. Nair's point, right? And Harini, what Harini discussed that, you know, uh, these these novel areas of development uh, can also include, can be planned, uh, including natural spaces and restored habitats and landscapes, uh, because that that is the way where livelihoods can be uh, secured uh, in rural economies, as Harini was also saying. But uh, yeah, I think, uh, I guess, Mahesh, you're, you've not answered though. <laughs> Do you no. really think that uh, systems in India, for example, are no longer resilient to cope with these extreme events? No, I don't think so. In the sense that uh, it might have been, uh, so we need to look at the response, whether the system comes back to what it was before. I mean, there are going to be instances when, you know, I mean, if you have a huge tsunami, it's going to knock out the, the mangroves, right? I mean, that doesn't mean it's beyond the point, but if uh, we need to look at the, the resilience of the system and whether it comes back, I think that will be the litmus test for us. But no, I don't think all ecosystems in India are beyond the point of no return. Not at all. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there was a question for Harini, um, uh, where, you know, the idea that even a watered-down report, such as the Kasturi Rangan report, uh, in saving the Western Ghats, uh, was rejected because of pressure coming from the communities, uh, since their land was being the that their lands were being denotified. So, um, so how does one? I mean, how does one engage with such arguments that are coming bottom from bottom up about change? About you know the uh, the fact that the Western Ghats uh, should not be you know notified as a as a protected area or a high biodiversity area, and therefore should not be you know subject to various uh, agricultural practices that would destroy that. So, I mean, how do you, how does one uh, begin to work in such a situation? Me, I think it's very hard uh, looking at, because I do know some of the background of the Western Ghats report at uh, both sides. It's, it's really been very hard. A lot of the problems that happened was that the recommendations of both reports, I think, were misrepresented to communities on ground. So the both reports, I mean... Uh, I hate to use the word politicized because I think any recommendations we make as science or in, on the environment are inevitably also political. So they will be politicized. But I think there was a, there were definitely possibilities of using environmental grassroots movements to communicate the, the ideas behind this report in a very different way than they were communicated. There were also missed opportunities of making these decisions much more democratically. I mean, if you've done a slow process where each panchayat had got together and got, decided what it wanted to do, and then a lot of panchayats together came together as a Zilla Parishad, it would have been a much slower process, but much more likelihood of this getting through. And uh, to come back to the second point, I think Sharath had on, um, can these communities be educated about the kinds of things they plan? I, mean, I think it's really difficult. Let's take the landscape around Bangalore. I mean, there's a huge amount of... Uh, uh, eucalyptus plantations, which we know is not the best thing to plant. But if you talk to farmers around Banargata National Park or many of these areas, they will tell you that anything else they plant, the elephants come and take. Probably if you or I were farmers in that point, in that place, we would not really need education. I mean, we would, may, may have the education, in fact, better than uh, you know anyone else. But you choose to plant eucalyptus because elephants will come all the way if you have one jackfruit tree or one mango tree in your house, you know. And devastate everything else in the park. So what would you do realistically? Or let's say you're a farmer in dry land, Karnataka or Tamil Nadu again. And you've migrated to the city because there's no water. Then you plant teak. And again, that's not the best thing to do from the biodiversity perspective. So, I mean, there's education. But I think more important than that is how do they make their economic livelihoods? Can you intervene in a way 
that can give you farmer support prices or support permaculture for three years or or do something that make the economics viable for them in a way that it also fixes the ecology. I really don't think we've done enough. There are a lot of good grassroots movements that seem to be doing this. But I think as scientists, I think this has been our part that we just to say this is good for biodiversity and ecology, but we're not really doing our part in terms of the practicalities. Put yourself in somebody else's shoes, see how it would play out or, or involve them in the thinking through of the problem. I, I think that, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a number of questions that link up to, you know, that, that idea, but, you know, one, can one redefine economic development? Can, you know, can one think about, uh, you know, <laughs> replacing this whole notion of the GDP with something else. Yes. Um, and, you know, and bring that about, you know, uh, in a, in a somewhat, you know, inclusive manner that, that, that links up to various, uh, various conditions that exist, you know, in very specific ways in, in, I guess, in ways that impact people. Uh, and I think the, I mean, it would be worth seeing, you know, if, I, hearing from each one of you, what I mean, what do you think? A are the chances of something like that, like that happening? B, um, you know, what kind of re de redefinition are we thinking of? <laughs> and uh, and C, you know, um, are they, you know, what are the what, what are the possibilities that that one can bring about a ground uh, up change in in such uh, such manner? So. Maybe, I don't know, if Harini, you want to take a stab at that first? Uh, maybe I'll go after a couple of times. Uh, maybe if Mahesh or Uma want to start. I was going to say, that's a trick question. It's unanswerable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, I don't have the answers. I mean, it's a huge challenge. I'm an ecologist. And like Harini was saying, right? I mean, it's easy to sit here and make all these solutions about like growing biodiversity and stuff like that. But the reality on the ground may be different for for different people. And I don't know what the solution is, but it's something that in, would involve like ecologists, economists, everybody put together. And uh, I know that's a very wishy-washy answer, but uh, that's the best I have right now. As in, But, you know, I'm hopeful that there are ways to go around it. Yeah. I think Vishwanath had a good point in the question and answers where he's asked, is, look, should we be think, rethinking our institutions and is local democracy a way to do this. And I think in a country like India, nothing, I mean, let's be real, nothing going to happen on the ground unless we have local democracy. Because otherwise you can have the best laid plans and policies and best indices, et cetera, et cetera, and things will not move on the ground. And so I think we really need to figure out how to get this. Now that's easier said than done because local institutions is also local politics, which is also, you know, things that change. It's not things that uh, unfortunately many scientists are comfortable with. So we try and stay away, but that's not the answer. And so I think there is a lot that needs to be done, but no silver bullet. Mm. Uma, do you want to say something? I think, I think they've, uh, you know, they've covered these things. I think just because it's hard though, doesn't mean that we, we shouldn't try and we have to, and we have to, I think, accept that it's going to be difficult. I think that's also one of the challenges because a lot of the times we want things to be simple in a political kind of uh, space and things aren't going to be simple. And I think we need to accept that. And I think uh, personally, I feel that uh, academics should also engage more in these uh, processes. Uh, they tend to uh, be often on their own um, and not want to get uh, muddied or involved in this because academia is about objectivity and not subjectivity. Uh, but I think it's important uh, for all of us to participate in these processes and raise our voices when we can. Yeah, no, I, and I think uh, Amit Sulanki makes a very important point that the problem of any environmental issue is linked with things such as caste, gender, bureaucracy, corruption, and so on. So, um, I mean, how does one even begin to engage? Uh, any thoughts? I'll let Harini take that. <laughs> I think we've all dealt with this in multiple ways. Um, I mean, if there's, I think, a lot of literature, some of which you take with a pinch of salt, but I think a lot that actually seems to show that when women are involved in local governance, 
then uh, you tend to get conservation as well as health as and well being as well as economic objectives and uh, so i think we really need to get uh, much of this development or the the decision making into the hands of women especially in uh, i mean in multiple ways i think there's now there seem to be suggestions even on the pandemic that uh, some of the places that are governed by women whether it's or uh, where uh, women do have a share in the running of things whether it's the kerala health minister or uh, new zealand uh, seem to be doing better so that i won't get into because that's a bit controversial but i think if you look at a number of other practical local democracy examples getting women involved and empowered definitely gives you a more holistic model of development how do you tackle that that's i think our biggest point how do you deal with corruption how do you deal with bureaucracy strengthening local democracy is our only answer transparency things like the right to information act you know that the rti i think has been incredibly powerful in getting a few and the forest rights act i think if you look at what has really helped large parts of uh indian ecology survive that were going to go in the past 5 or 6 years it's been these two the forest rights act and the rti and then the national green tribunal so it's essentially it's people coming up and questioning these and somehow managing to stake a claim on the fact that these are their resources and they will have a, a decision making power over the fact that they should stay and so that power needs to be strengthened but all of these are getting diluted the ngt decisions are rarely followed the rti is getting diluted the forest rights act may be withdrawn so you know what, what do we do from here if if all these these are these were our our plus points our bright spots in the past few years we need to actually work to i think strengthen them and make sure that they are there they not that they get thrown out yeah no i think that's that's uh, you know very very important issue and i think unless as um, individuals and citizens we we you know raise raise a certain awareness that these are crucial for you know for some of these matters we, it's going to be a lost cause and i think uh, with that i'm going to take one last question from uh, i think it's kausto uh, who asks what are institutions doing um about make raising these issues are there, are there are institutions coming together to say things um perhaps there are uh you know there are they they you know i mean first of all would institutions saying things make a difference i mean that would be one question the other would be uh a question would be if institutions uh, you know come together what are they saying in terms of what's happening currently and if i mean i i would want all each one of you to say something about that you know a whether it's a good thing or whether um you know whether we should you know have have more more um you know grassroots movements uh, speak speak up or should institutions that that be all part of engage in this uh, battle at this time i can i can go first i mean i think that there are uh, i like i said earlier i think it's really important that people come together at this time and i personally think that it would be really important for Uh, institutions to uh, comment on these things of course with a scientific basis um for scientific institutions right uh, based on evidence and data um and uh, otherwise uh, they would just be they would be commenting based on uh, or emotion uh, which i think should not be diluted scientific institutions should respond or comment based on data and evidence <clears throat> but i i know i mean I, i don't know but it could be that several institutions may shy away from this uh, especially because uh, most of the institutions in india are government funded and since we depend on the government for funding it may be that institutions may feel this is too risky a thing to do to, to criticize uh, what's going on in the government but i think that maybe in if many institutions come together and uh, uh, talk together maybe it will have an impact whether it has an impact or not sorry if many people come together many institutions come together they might feel less afraid of this whether it has an impact or not i don't that i don't know i don't i'm not high enough in the pecking order to know what impacts the decisions the government makes so i leave that yeah so jitu i my personal opinion is i definitely think institutions need institutions need to get involved 
And I also think that many of these problems cannot be solved by single institutions, and there's a need for multiple institutions to come through. And everything that we've talked about today sort of points to that. I don't know, there was maybe, uh, Uma, I was hoping you'd talk about the One Health. Everybody's talking about One Health mm -hmm. initiatives. And you can't do that in a single institution. There has to be, we need to rethink how institutions at all levels work together, right? I mean, it can't be one institution like dealing with roads, another with water, another with something else, because the problems are interlinked. And I really do think that uh, we need to rethink the way institutions interact. Again, I don't know how this will be done, but it's something that needs to get done in my opinion. I mean, I, I've absolutely, I, I also, I mean, many voices are far stronger than one voice or a number of individual voices alone. And that's always the case. You will also, I think uh, there was a lot of press reporting recently about the fact that a number of uh, well-known scientists across India wrote a letter to the government uh, expressing concern about the number of environmental projects that were cleared in a very short span of time during the lockdown through these video calls. Uh, saying that this is, you know, not the way to do to handle environmental clearances. So sometimes things like this really get attention, and but whether it has the influence it or the that it should have, one doesn't know. But definitely it has man, more influence than individual voices. But I think Mahesh also raises a very important point of uh, how do we coordinate better on the other hand also, because each institution will have different strengths, and it's not it's academic institutions, it's government institutions, it is also civil society institutions. One of the thing, places, you know, if you look at the few bright spots in India where relief work has worked very well, it's been because there are individual actors working with civil society and working with the government. And it's when you get all of this together that you really see action. So now there seems to be, for instance, a number of civil society organizations coming together and working with the government to see post, okay, once all these migrants workers reach back, what is the rehabilitation programs and how do you strengthen, you know, the Kharif crop has to be planted. What do you do from here on to make sure that uh, the economy doesn't collapse even more than it does and people's lives are not affected even more than they are. So, so a lot of these problems, whether it's One Health or whether it's fixing the agriculture uh, crisis that is looming on us, uh, require all of these institutions coming together. And so that is something we need to, to really see how we can get that, that done. I know I said last question, but Harini, yeah. closer to home, uh, they, there was an issue about, you know, what, what does one see about strengthening the biodiversity that one sees around one in, yeah. in the cities that we, that we all live in, or in the, perhaps the spaces that uh, um, Krishnaya was talking about, uh, which yeah. are, you know, uh, are there ways and means that one can begin to build, you know, sustainable biodiverse urban spaces? Absolutely. I think, I think, I mean, to me, it comes back to just reimagining our cities from a perspective of commons, of not, uh, so I think the way we, most of the way, the green spaces, look at all the green spaces we have, lakes, parks, you know, all of the, the trees on the roads. We tend to think of green spaces are very landscaped. You know, you have this little hedge, you manicure it, you uh, bring this turf grass corporate campuses, you bring the turf grass, you spray the heck out of things. I think we need to start thinking of places, can you rewild the city? If we think of rewilding cities as our uh, approach to move forward, I think we'll fix a lot of things from uh, diseases, uh, the chance of emergence of new diseases, to uh, issues of human health, to issues of pollution, and to issues of uh, nutrition and livelihoods. You know, if you can have wild spaces, so again, coming back to our survey, when we were talking about these women who harvest wild plants from across Bangalore, their common complaint was even if you go to places like Lalbagh and Kaban Park now, they're increasingly becoming manicured spaces. They can't harvest plants from there. You know? If you look at the lakes, we want to put stone buns and pitches. And so we need to, to figure out how we can rewild, whether it's our little garden patch or the pots that you have at home or your... Uh, apartment garden or uh, the street in front of you you know can you can you think of rewilding the city and i think if we can make that a slogan we tend to think of planting trees and one tree is the same as another you know you plant 100 eucalyptus trees or you plant 100 people trees they very that's very different in terms of the biodiversity they support so if you think of rewilding as a slogan I, I, as a community effort as a commons so it, and i think when i say com commons i don't mean just human part of the commons i mean the the rest of the world around it. so yeah. But definitely, we have to think of cities as, as a very important part of our biodiversity. Otherwise, it's not just something that is in a distant forest area. Yeah, 
very good point. So, so let me, let me, I, I think we're really going way over time. So I just want to know if, I mean, some closing thoughts from each one of you. Um, shall we start with uh, Uma? Uh, then come to you, Harini, and then Mahesh. Uh, um, I mean, I guess it's it's just been a really interesting discussion, and uh, unfortunately, we couldn't answer um, all of the questions. Uh, but I think that um, you know this idea of the circle of life uh, today. You know, we realize more than ever that we are connected to biodiversity, uh, and we can't just be in our bubble in a gated community. It will still affect us um, anywhere in the world, whatever happens across the world. I think this is this is not something we should take negatively, but very positively think about the future and uh, imagine a new future where we are uh, really thinking about harmony with nature uh, much more than uh, being at odds with nature. Thanks, Uma. Yeah, I I think that's very true, and I I mean I, the way I look at it. I think in any times of crisis, whether it's any, whether it's us personally or loved ones in, in, in danger of any sort, is also a time for reflecting. Life is short. What do you want out of life? How would you like to live? How would you like the world to live? So I think if we can re-engage, use this crisis uh, as a time of reflection to see how do we think people should live and how do we think the world should live. I think one of the things we're realizing is we need a lot more compassion in the world and a lot more empathy and a lot more interconnection. And that empathy, kindness, and interconnection is not just between us, but between the natural world, with, between us and the natural world outside. So if we can use this as a time of reflection, I think that that really takes us forward. Thanks, Uma. Mahesh? Unmute. Yes. Right. So it, I guess in many ways, I'm going to echo you know, the sentiments that uh, both Uma and uh, Harini raised in that, you know, from a break, even though it's a breakdown, there's an opportunity for a breakthrough here. And, uh, you know, there is an opportunity here for us to rethink the way, uh, the way ahead. And it has to happen at all levels. And I would fully agree that, like, you know, every individual, it has to come at the individual level. I think that's a very strong uh, level at which change occurs. We can't be waiting for institutions to, you know, I think it has to start from locally from home. I fully agree with uh, Harini's uh, thinking on this. Yeah. Well, on, on, on that note, uh, let's uh, get down to work. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists um, and also BIC, I mean, for a really fascinating and fantastic discussion. Um, I hope we took a few contrarian views, but it didn't seem there were that many. Um, I guess uh, that's, that's the power of having such good people give uh, a, their, their perspective. So thank you all for listening. And over to you, Ravi. Uh, thanks, thanks, Jitu. Thanks, Harini, Omar, Mahesh, for doing this session. Uh, thanks to the Bangalore Sustainability Forum. Uh, 